So we're more than willing to entertain uh, questions from uh, the audience. Um, we have a couple over here, and uh, we have a microphone person who's going to be coming or running with the microphone. Well, apparently we're doing something exciting enough to attract the attention of the newly appointed political reporter for the Globe and Mail, national political reporter Adam Rybonsky, who's in town this week. We don't usually get visits like that from uh, such celebrity media stars. Uh, so he thinks there's a connection between this, and uh, that, that connection, that link, could be on a number of different levels. It could be in the minds of voters who see the disarray in the NDP, and the flagging momentum of the national NDP and think the NDP is sick and it's going to do poorly. It, 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 I think the bigger impact will be on the level of organization, dedication, engagement, commitment by people who have to work both levels of the political system within the party. And so I think that will take a toll. And we'll have to see how, on the leadership level, how Mr. Trudeau fares in his first outing doing retail politics on the big stage against a nasty uh, leader who takes no prisoners. I mean, it, it's just going to be, uh, it's just, the, the campaign, I think they've got so many ads in the, in the, in the bank that they'll use eventually against Trudeau. Uh, I just think they're holding back uh, until, for the moment, uh, it's, it's closer to the event. I, I guess one thing that's, that's quite distinctive and that distinguishes what's happening in Manitoba from the federal is there doesn't seem to be much pressure on Mr. Harper to uh, uh, to step down. It raises uh, the sort of questions about what needs to be there within the within the party. There's certainly not the collapse in the kind of polls that the, that Curtis was uh, uh, was showing. In the absence of that, I wouldn't expect to see uh, much. There's also, I think, this total uncertainty in the minds of. Uh, pretty much all three major parties federally about what's going to happen in the next election. So the absence of certainty is not going to push them to make big changes. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point, Chris, and, and we've seen that in our in our polls over the last little while. Uh, that you, the, of course, we, we talked about that before, there's sort of being this big gender gap where men are more likely to support the PCs, women are more likely to support the NDP. That gap doesn't really exist to the same extent anymore, but it is still there, actually. The, uh, the, 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 the NDP do have more support among women than they do uh, amongst men. And, and I think that, you know, I think that, you know, to some extent, you know, part of the, uh, you know, part of the argument for, uh, for changing leaders is that that, Support has been eroded because you know in a lot of ways that's what it has allowed the NDP to be successful not just among women but also uh, geographically within uh, the city of Winnipeg especially in uh, South Winnipeg and uh, West Winnipeg and places that are more likely to vote Tory in the past. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've got the number of the bill right and what the content of the bill was. We like to boast that that we're unique among legislatures in Canada in terms of allowing for public input at the second stage, uh, second read after the second reading stage of a bill. Um, I don't know if the government's been derelict in its duty. It, it didn't show up. I don't know. I mean, those those sessions can be quite constructive when witnesses come with expert knowledge and the opposition is not out to play uh, games or the government is not out to control. Other times they be become circus-like and uh, I can remember taking a wolf cup troop there one time to watch and I took it away in dismay. I created uh, 25 uh, cynics and they were <laughs> word of age you have to be cynics. I mean, it, it, so it, it can be uh, an interesting democratic exercise or it can be uh, simply an extension of the mindless partisanship that passes for democratic debate in our legislature, which is highly polarized, as you know. Well, um, when the next leader of the NDP calls me on the day after, uh, after 10 o'clock, because I'm retired, um, I'll have a whole agenda for him or her, uh, and it will include much stronger committees of the legislature, 
It will include uh, someone in the Premier's office who adopts a more open, consultative style, doesn't take backbenchers for granted, Do it doesn't act unilaterally in relation to um, his cabinet colleagues, will appoint more legislative assistants. These are cabinet ministers in training. They get a little extra money. Give them a job description, something to do, not the menial chores that most ministers give them. Someone designated in the Premier's office to maintain liaison with the caucus. Uh, party task forces sent out across the, par uh, the province to talk to people on forthcoming sensitive issues. The list is longer than we have tonight. So uh, this is not a healthy democratic system, quite frankly. The legislature is a prize that you win when you gain power and you have it under your absolute control. And it's been true of all parties. And it's uh, self-respecting politicians today should not allow themselves to be treated the way they are. They've got to gain the courage of their convictions. Trudeau, the senior Trudeau, once said that when MPs are off Parliament Hill, they're nobody. The exact reverse is true. When they're on Parliament Hill or in the legislature, they're nobody. It's when they're out in their constituencies, they're really somebody. And they have talents and ideas to offer, and they're not utilized to the extent they should be. So endeth the rant. Does anyone else want to uh, <laughs> speak? Go ahead. Add in a couple. Uh, very, very few whipped votes, and allowing caucus to trigger a leadership review, as Michael Chong has suggested in his bill. Um, any other questions coming in? While we're getting questions from the floor, one of the questions I did want to ask as well is, um, while we were in the midst of this kind of crisis in Manitoba, that seems to be where we're focusing right now anyway, um, how capable uh, are we of actually seeing good government going on uh, if the Premier's eye is on a different ball, per se? Do you think public policy is actually moving in any kind of positive direction at this point in time, or basically is it just all a big gob of glue that's... Um, that's just held up in the in the track, as it were. I don't know if that's a polite way of saying it, but I'm going to say it that way. There you go. Where, who wants to start with that? What's their sense? Go ahead, Dave. Uh. I want to approach it a bit differently in the sense that well, from my observations of what, what went on in Alberta when they changed the leadership, that obviously the candidates who were seeking the uh, leadership, none of them were in the, uh, were in, the, in cabinet, including Mr. Prentice. What struck me is that it was a period of really very little getting done in government, even though none of the candidates were, were there. There was this notion that it was a more of a caretaker situation. And I, uh, I think that's the way people who are in those positions are, are going to uh, approach it, uh, even if they're not a candidate. You know, obviously, if you're the premier, you've got to be distracted by this. So again, in the Alberta case, we had a, a budget and a speech from the throne that went by almost unnoticed in terms of public opinion or public notice. Um, it's impaired the functioning of government. Um, we had a uh, kind of throne speech which consisted of glittering generalities, not much content there. They're now trying to prepare a spring budget uh, and they're having real difficulty because the financial circumstances are so tight and a, a number of people around the table have almost no first-hand experience of being in cabinet and treasury board where the decisions on the budget are being made. Uh, interest groups who approach government to get their points across find meetings postponed. I had an aging council told me he saw the new minister responsible for seniors and aging, and she asked, could you tell me in five minutes what I should know about this field, uh, or something like that. And maybe we should have or, uh, arrange a, a further meeting. One advocacy group called me and asked, what are we going to do if one of the leadership rivals is poaching our ideas, that we had them in front of cabinet before this broke into the open, and now they're stealing those ideas and uh, claiming that they could, could get no traction for them when they were in government. And finally, I just want to say this. I was wrong when I said that Selinger can't campaign out of the Premier's office. It's unfair. It creates an un uneven playing field. I think he's suffered more constraints than we imagined. He has to go there day in and day out to do routine business of government. He can't make any announcements with everybody scrutinizing them. He had to limit himself to policy announcements. He's bound by cabinet confidentiality and solidarity. He can't go to Swan uh, River to announce a mental health uh, building because his opponents will attack him. So uh, he has been handicapped by this, and I, I was wrong. I thought that 
he had beavers as premier. He does, but there are significant constraints. As a handicap by his own choice, I'll point out. Go ahead, Sam, you have a question. Come up with a new name for the party? Um, <laughs> I, I'm not really sure. I mean, they have a huge, huge challenge on their hands. And, and uh, I mean, winning the leadership is going to be the easy part for whoever wakes up on, on March 9th as a new leader. I don't know how you're going to uh, rebuild those rifts. They're so deep. Uh, they're so solidified and institutionalized almost within the party. Um, and despite, you know, uh, Minister McIntosh and others, you know, that, that have been trying to sort of build some consensus, that certainly doesn't seem to be happening. It's gotten nasty, it's gotten personal, it's gotten very public. Um, I don't really know where the party's going to go from here. It's going to be a very long time, I think, before they're going to be able to, to, to heal that, never mind be in a ready situation to fight an next provincial election a year from now. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think what's, I think one of the interesting thing is, is the things I would look at too, is I think if you look at this over a longer term, is that really in a lot of ways, this leadership race and the contestants and, and the sort of factions within the NDP, I mean, these uh, factions have been there, you know, broadly speaking, for the last six years. They go back to the 2009 leadership race, and in some aspects of it, it actually goes back before that. Uh, and I think that that's, so I think whoever the, uh, you know, whoever wins uh, and whoever is the premier uh, or continues to be the premier, that's going to be the really difficult thing to do. I mean, often there's sort of a big show and political conventions made of unity and making the votes unanimous and coming together. And I think this is really going to be very, very difficult because in a lot of ways, I mean, what has happened and what has transpired in Manitoba within the NDP over the last decade is very similar to what happened with the Liberals over 10, 30 years in Ottawa, or what happened to the Labour Party in the United Kingdom with uh, different factions kind of, between, you know, between one another. And, and that, you know, that party is still working that out uh, over there. It's very, very similar kind of circumstances. So I think for the new, whoever the new leader is, they're going to have to try to bring their opponents in, you know, to the extent that they can. I just don't know how possible that's going to be, depending on what the outcome is. Go ahead, Dave. Again, I'm not as immersed in Manitoba politics as, as my colleagues, but from what I've observed by, from a little bit of a distance, I, I'm not able to identify a huge difference in the support levels for the three candidates. And, and that may offer some possibility of a, of a way forward in the sense that it looks to me, and, and you guys, my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, but the leadership is going to be chosen by second choices, not by, uh, uh, not by first choices. And that kind of, uh, of compromise may put something on the table that's not there now. At the moment, everybody's just thinking about being first or, or second, but the, the people who support the candidate who's third, they're going to have to make some tough choices for the, uh, for the party, and those are the people that the winner can really try and reach out to accommodate. So it's the kingmaker, the potential of a kingmaker to be able to sort of plaster over some of these differences. Right. Go ahead, Paul. Just sneaking a comment about the uh, human dynamics here. Whoever wins, I think, should have some private meetings. The rhetoric will happen, and uh, and it will be interpreted rather cynically as tactical and strategic and so on. But I think some honest conversations among the results about uh, apologies. Uh, apologies for that there may be genuine and heartfelt, or there may be ex explanations that I didn't foresee the damage that was going to be done, or they may be simply uh, uh, symbolic gestures that people want to engage in. And that has to go along with forgiveness, talking to people about, we've done this to ourselves, and we have we can't, got to get over this. We've got to put this party back together again. We split it apart in deep and emotional ways so that personal friendships have been destroyed holiday parties took place in three locations because you couldn't have members of different camps come to the same holiday party after the end of the last session. This has been agonizing and wrenching for this party. You have to say no retaliation. Uh, you have to be careful about just the right balance, saying to those who attack Mr. Salinger's leadership that you may get back in cabinet at some point, but we don't reward uh, outright open revolts. And you've got to say something about those backbenchers who feel their talents have been wasted on the backbenches for too long, after what, 15 years in government now or something like that, but that they deserve a chance and that there will be more invitation and more jobs for legislative assistance. It's a human, interpersonal thing. 
and I think it was Woody Allen, saying, you get a lot of credit just for showing up. This leader has to show up to more occasions when backbenchers gather and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Mulroney was in the low teens when I did work on party caucuses, and he, there was never a peep out of the caucus. Everybody was on site because he had them on his Rolodex, and they were over to breakfast, and he asked about their uh, wives and, and husbands and kids, and well, anything he could do for them, he'd try to help. It's very human. Uh, politics is emotional, and people's egos are involved. So get over your damaged ego, and let's get on. Uh, you, and that all is related to self-interest, because we'll send ourselves into the political wilderness if we don't get together. Just a, one more kind of, I think, uh, sort of point for, for discussion is the Conference Board of Canada has come up with a really rosy over economic overview for Manitoba. Part of it was that they said that the infrastructure spending has been one of the reasons that's driving uh, an actual uh, economic recovery for Manitoba. And the NDP obviously could own that. Uh, by saying that they use that PST to, to spend on infrastructure. What's the chances of the next leader, regardless of whether it's Selinger, Oswald, or Ashton, to be able to turn it around based on this rosy economic uh, outturn from the accountants board and some really poor, poor leadership on behalf of the opposition parties in this, in this province? Uh, what do you think? Uh, I'll start with you, Curtis, uh, the bolster in the corner. <laughs> Well, well, like I said before, it's it's possible. It, you know, even though the NDP has been down, it, it is possible. I would expect. I mean, if I were to make a bet, I would think that the poll that we do right after the uh, leadership race wraps up will probably show the NDP higher than they are currently. Uh, how much closer they'll be to the Conservatives? I guess that's a uh, you know that's that's an open question. Uh, you know the, the the interesting thing is I mean the thing you mentioned the thing about the economy I mean in some in some respects I think that you know that has to do with uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan slowing down and you know kind of the uh, you know they're the they're the hare and, and we're the tortoise just kind of chugging along uh, but you know none, nonetheless I mean this is kind of a you know it's a steady as she goes place in a lot of ways and uh, we've also seen in other jurisdictions where uh, it looks like a you know an incumbent party is kind of left for dead and. Uh, in the, and they, they managed to uh, they managed to pull it out and win. It happened in Ontario last year. It happened in BC before that. It's possible. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, it, it's unlikely, but it's possible. And so you know, it certainly could. Uh, it certainly could happen. I wouldn't. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't totally write off the NDP this Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I've certainly been wrong more times than I've been right when I try to make political predictions. Uh, but you know, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say I don't think it's going to happen. I think Manitobans feel betrayed. Uh, whether you're an NDP supporter, whether or not you voted for the party or not, I think they feel betrayed by what they've seen happening. And I think those scars go so deep, and as Paul reminds us, rightfully so, politics is a, a, as much about emotion as it is anything else. And I don't think the party's going to be able to salvage anything, arguing rational ideas or look what we've done with infrastructure. I think those scars are going to go pretty deep, and the party's going to have to really prove itself again to Manitobans. That, that it can it can regain their trust. So where do the disenfranchised NDP park their vote though? Because would they actually vote for Ballister or would they just not show up? I think they're just not gonna show up. Um, you know, we've seen some blips for the Liberals for sure, but we're certainly not seeing the kinds of numbers for the Liberals we should be seeing. And I think that's again because Ms. Bukhari is trying. She's not really grown into being a leader. And, and I think Manitobans are recognizing that. And quite frankly, the progressive conservatives are just, if you're an NDP voter, they're just, they're perceived to be just too too much on the right to be able to be a comfortable fit for disgruntled NDP. So I don't think they're going to show up. Dave, what do you think? What's your sense? Well, I, I would go back to the uh, data that I saw from Australia, uh, where really divisive party leaderships were followed by electoral failure. Yeah. And I, I think that that's generally the uh, the pattern. I mean, it's a, it's really a kind of hail mary pass. But what happens with most hail mary passes? They fall in the end zone with nobody catching. And that would certainly be my prediction of an outcome in this situation. Paul, right. well, last last voice is yours. Well, um, you know, it's been a long time in power, and uh, Canadians tend to get rid of governments after about a decade or so, and so they've had more than a fair run of things. Uh, and they've been helped by a number of things, a broad coalition of voter support that they developed over time, a development of a kind of moderate image, 
the, the benefits of an electoral system that helps them more than the Conservatives. And then the Conservatives have been their friends by uh, chewing up their leaders in succession. And so, but I think the, the general mood for change and then the disarray and the belief that they uh, they dis, uh, they failed to deliver on their promises and they've lied to Manitobans in some ways. That's going to be the, it'll be a, a huge political setback. Whether it will be down to the level of 12, uh, because that would happen in 1988, we don't have the car scares phenomena this time around. The liberals exactly. are, not, are not there. Yeah. So I, I don't know whether it'll be that deep a setback, but it's a rebuilding exercise and a generational turnover, I think, in the party. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think that this has been a really excellent panel on leadership, and I certainly want to bring some new information. Do you want to say goodbye there, uh, Robert? I will say goodbye. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Please join me in thanking our panelists. And I would like to invite you back next month, uh, March 19th. We'll be discussing the provincial budget. Um, come out and uh, enjoy a discussion about uh, how the sausage gets made and how it affects various stakeholders. So looking forward to that. Please fill out your feedback forms. Again, many of your ideas, many of your ideas end up on the stage up here. Thanks again, have a great night.